Uh, welcome everybody to my talk about Lambda's uses and abuses. Uh, this talk was born from the last year uh, meeting C++ talk when I also had the pre presentation about Lambda's, more about basics and about the evolution of Lambda's. And the comments I got at the end of the talk was that it was a very interesting talk, but it stopped at the moment when it was started, when it started to get really interesting. Uh, so today's talk is about things that, uh, yeah, are hopefully more interesting for some of you. Uh, now to give you a glimpse of what is it, uh, what it is about. Uh, I think many of you already tried to write a code like this, uh, that you had uh, a kind of a couple of lambdas and you tried to put them into a container, let's say a vector, you know, to store them for later usage. And of course, this doesn't work. This doesn't work work whatsoever because, you know, we are trying to put different lambdas into a homogeneous uh, a container, which only accepts one type, and those are totally different lambdas. So it's not going to work. Now, maybe some of you also tried this one. So, you know, putting a couple of lambdas with seemingly uh, exactly the same types, so the same kind of parameters, uh, the same kind of return values. Uh, I mean, they look almost the same. And this also failed. If you tried ever to compile such a piece of code, uh, you would have noticed that it fails tragically uh, with something that tells you that class template argument detection failed or something similar. So a similar error is also possible. Uh, what, what it's about is that you're still trying to put different types or items of different types with different types into a homogeneous container. It's not going to work. Uh, every single Lambda that you declare in your program uh, gives arise to a different type. Even if it's exactly the same lambda expression, you get a different type generated by the compiler. So you cannot just put those uh, into one container. Forget about it. Now, what if I told you that it is, however, you know, to write code like this. So you can put lambdas into a container and it's going to accept it. It's just a different kind of a container. Uh, what's even better it uses absolutely no dynamic memory allocation, you know, uh, and you can lay, modify this container just to your wishes. So it will function in a way that you yourself want. Like, for example, uh, you might define a special function call on this container uh, that will call those lambdas depending on the argument. So you get some kind of polymorphic behavior uh, on the functions. Uh, this talk is about lambdas, about the uses and abuses of the lambdas, and about how you can write a composable code with lambdas. It's also about generic programming and about programming with types. But before we start going into the lambdas and how to write this code, let's focus on the basics. Basics are pretty important, so we establish a common ground. Every single lambda looks exactly the same. It starts with a lambda introducer, which is your uh, also known as a capture list. In C++20, it can be followed by template parameters. Uh, then come the lambda parameters, so the formal parameters to your function, specifiers if there are any, uh, like for example, mutable, and then the lambda body. What's also important to understand about lambdas is that the lambda expression that you write in your code is not what the compiler generates, uh, or it's not what you actually get in the end. For every single Lambda expression that you write in the code, what the compiler generates is the so-called closure type. And it's a class type, a unique class type for every single Lambda that you write with a const expert inline function call operator. So this one. And this function call operator in this unique closure type basically is exactly the same as the Lambda that you define. So it takes exactly, exactly the same arguments uh, in the same order with the same times and returns the same types as the Lambda. And of course, the body is also the same. So this is what the compiler generates, the so-called unique closure type for every single Lambda expression. Now, things get a bit more interesting if you use generic Lambdas. So if you write a piece of code where your Lambda uses auto types, uh, like here, the compiler is going to generate a function call operator template. 
So not anymore just a function call, call operator, but a template or a, a function template. And for every single auto type that you have defined in your Lambda expression, there is going to be a unique invented template type in this function call operator template. So every single auto corresponds to a new, unique invented type, which might lead to the problems sometimes. The rest is the same. It's still context pair. It's still in line. You know, nothing changes. Uh, in C plus plus twenty, of course, you are able to specify yourself what kind of uh, templates parameters you would like to take. So we got this possibility uh, of specifying the template parameters just after the Lambda introducer and before the Lambda parameters are defined. And of course, you can also use concepts. Uh, so you can, for example, uh, constrain your template parameters in C++20 to a concept standard integral, uh, which is going to be reflected in the closure type that, it's gen that is generated by the compiler. Last but not least, uh, captures. The lambdas that I showed up till now didn't contain any captures, so they didn't capture anything. Uh, but more often than not, you are going to capture something into your Lambda. So you are going to capture the variables, like the local variables, uh, into the basically the body of your Lambda. And what the compiler then generates is a closure type, which has members. It has data members, and those data members basically correspond to the variables that you captured. Like in this case, since I captured k uh, by value, I'm going to have a data member, maybe it's going to be named K, nobody knows it really, but there is going to be a data member in my closure type, and it's going to be initialized with the value uh, of the captured value uh, variable, so with 42 in this case. And this gives a rise to an interesting problem, uh, which bites many of you when you start playing around with lambdas. When you try to compile this piece of code, it's not going to work. And the compiler is going to complain that you are trying to assigned to a read-only variable k. It's going to complain specifically about this line. And this is because the lambdas work totally differently than the normal function, uh, than the normal member functions. Uh, the normal member functions, when you define them, can modify the member variables by default, unless you specify them to be const. Now, lambdas work differently. When you write a lambda and don't specify anything, so you don't specify whether it's a const uh, member function or not in the lambda expression itself, the compiler by default generates a closure type with a constant member uh, function call operator. And to prevent it, you have to add the keyword mutable. You have to specify that the lambda is mutable. And then what you get is also a closure type with a non-const member uh, function call operator inside, so we are able to modify the member variables and everything uh, works as expected. So this is basically the common ground about lambdas. The most important takeaway is that lambdas give a rise to closure. So always when you have a lambda, you also generate, or under the hood, the compiler generates a closure type. Uh, for every single lambda, a uh, single or a unique closure type. Now, before C++20, lambdas were quite powerful, uh, but C++20 brought uh, with it a lot of new additions to lambda. Some of them we already have seen, like the first one, uh, the uh, explicit template parameters for lambdas, for generic lambdas. Uh, but there are others, like the lambdas in C++20 are now default constructible. They can appear in unevaluated context. Uh, there is this thing that's called uh, pack init uh, or expansion of the uh, of pack expansion of the init captures. Uh, you can capture structured bindings in the lambdas in C++20, which wasn't possible before. Uh, some weirdness around the captures uh, in member functions was also resolved in C++20. And uh, also there were proposals targeting the, uh, the self-referencing, so recursive lambdas, which also weren't possible before C++20. And I'm going to just show you some of them, some of those features and how they influence the code with, that we write nowadays, or how they can influence the code that we write now when we use lambdas. 
so first of all, generic lambdas. I think this is the biggest addition. This is like the ga game changer for uh, how the lambdas can be used. It simplifies code, but it also makes for more expressive code. Like, for example, imagine a very simple situation when you have a vector of some uh, type, like a double, and then you call a function push one, which adds just one value to this vector. So, so nothing else. This push one can, of course, be a lambda expression. So before C20, when you wanted to write such a function uh, and be this function a generic function, you had no other option but to write ugly code like this because this function has no idea what kind of vector you call it with so the lambda has no idea what kind of vector it is what kind of items it contains you have to explicitly grab this type out of the vector uh, by using the decal type uh, on the vector grabbing the value type out of it and so on and so on and after you've done it only uh, you can maybe instantiate some value factory or whatever your mechanism is and push back the value of this specific type onto the vector. Now with C20, this got much easier. Notice that we can just specify a template parameter T and write a code uh, or write a lambda that takes a std vector of T as an argument. And we are going to use the template uh, argument deduction uh, to deduce T at when we call the function uh, so there is no other work that we have to do. You can directly use this T uh, to instantiate or to create your value factory and push a value onto a vector. The next thing is, of course, concepts. Uh, so not only you can write code that, spe uh, that specifies the template parameters explicitly, you can also constrain those uh, template parameters. And there are two ways to do it. You can either use... Uh, uh, the, the shortcut way, so instead of writing the type name or a class, uh, write your concept name, and this way you constrain your T to be a std inst integral and nothing else. Or you can use the require requires uh, uh, after the lambda parameters, and both will work the same way. It will basically restrict uh, these two lambdas or this lambda, the sum lambda, to accept only integral types, and both A and B basically have to be the set of the same type because they are, uh, the compiler needs to be able to deduce it, uh, both the arguments to be the same type, otherwise it's not going to work. So when you try to call it, for example, with something that doesn't satisfy the concept, like with a double, uh, it's a no-go. The code won't go, it's not going to compile. The next big thing uh, for some of us, especially for those of you who uh, ever use a policy-based design is lambdas that appear in an evaluated context. So for example, when you want to instantiate, when you want to create a, a container adapter, a, a priority queue, you have to pass uh, the ordering to it as a template argument. And before, the only way to pass this process ordering in this case, so in, uh, to pass this ordering policy to the priority queue, was by writing a class and passing the type of this class to the queue. Now, because lambdas can appear in unevaluated context, you can use decal type on them. Decal type is an evaluated context, uh, and now you can put a lambda inside it uh, into decal type and grab the type of the lambda itself and use it later uh, when you play with your generic code or with your policy-based design. This only works for captureless lambdas nothing else. It also implies that when you do it, you will later on instantiate this process ordering uh, closure somewhere. So you will have to create it. You will have to default construct process ordering something in your somewhere in your queue, because otherwise it's not going to work. And this is also possible. Captureless lambdas are now default constructible. So you can do it. Uh, another latest and the greatest, and this is something I really like, is the init capture uh, pack expansion. And basically, you know, when you see a piece of code like this, normally your head bo starts boiling, uh, but it's a very, uh, very simple piece of code once you understand what it's doing. But you have a function, make tasks, that takes 
another function f and some arguments. And what it does, it creates a lambda, or actually it creates a closure that captures both the function and the argument that you passed to your make task and returns this lambda. So later on, uh, once you create it, once you call the make task with some parameters, like in this case, I'm calling the make task with some lambda that just prints uh, the arguments passed to it. Uh, and I pass also the arguments. I can use the task closure just to run the lambda and the lambda then will basically call my f function with the standard string argument and nothing else. So it's a way of creating the task closures, right? Now, the problem with this is that there is an unnecessary copy being made here. So we are making an unnecessary copy of the arguments. Uh, and you know, it's definitely not good. This is not something you want to do, uh, especially for expensive to think uh, things that are expensive to copy. Now in C++20, uh, you can use pack expansion for init captures. So in this context, it's possible uh, to use the pack expansion of the arguments passed to the make task fun function in the init capture and no unnecessary copy is being created anymore, which is pretty cool. And for some applications, uh, it's super usable. And the last but not least, recursive lambdas. Now, before I even go into it, I have to disappoint you. The recursive lambdas are still not possible in C++20. There was a proposal that addressed recursive lambdas. There actually were quite a few proposals over the years uh, that addressed recursive lambdas, but they weren't accepted because there are other proposals in the work, in the work uh, that are much more generic and also solve the problem of recursive lambdas. Now, for some reasons, recursive lambdas is something that everybody wants to write. So everybody who ever played with lambdas at some point uh, tries to write a recursive lambda. So a lambda that calls itself. Uh, in this example, it's a very simple example, when the recursive lambda is calculating the sum of integers from zero to n, nothing else. And I think you also tried to write a code like this many times maybe not with lambdas, just with normal functions. If you tried it with lambdas and you have written code like this, you got an error. So you notice there is a recursive call to the sum. And when you try to run this kind of code, what you get is some kind of error, depending on the compiler, of course. You see different things being uh, 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 printed on the screen. Uh, but the clue of it is that you are trying to use an incomplete type. In your lambda expression, you're trying to use sum, which at this point is not yet fully defined. And the compiler just cannot do it. You cannot use a type which is not yet fully defined. So before it can really you know, understand what this type is, what the sum is, you cannot really use it. Now, you might try to be smart. And instead of just using the sum, uh, remembering that each lambda gives a rise to a closure uh, when you compile it, you might try to write code like this. Now. And luckily, it's also not going to work. So explicit call to the operate to the function call operator of your closure is also not going to work. Surprisingly, a year ago, it still worked, I think, in Clunk, if I am not mistaken. So there was some bug in it, and it accepted the a, a piece of code like this. Not anymore. You cannot write code like this. It's not going to work. You are going to basically get an error that you are trying to use an undeclared operator. Uh, well, another try. Maybe the function pointers are to the rescue. When you basically use a function pointer on the left-hand side of this expression, you fully define the type of the sum. It's a pointer to a function that takes an integer and returns an integer. So you know the type of what the sum is, right? So you can use it recursively. Why not? Well, when you try to write, run this kind of code, the compiler is going to complain that the sum is not captured. And it is actually right. You know, sum is just a variable. You didn't capture it, and you're trying to use it within the lambda expression. So you try to capture it. Why not capture it by reference? Now everything should work, right? Well, no, it still doesn't work. And it doesn't work for a very simple reason. Uh, lambdas that capture something are not convertible to function pointers. Only the lambdas that don't capture anything are convertible to function pointers. So you have a kind of a chicken and an egg problem, right? Uh, you cannot use 
uh, the sum without capturing it. Uh, on the other hand, if you capture it, you cannot convert it to the function pointer. So at this point, you might want to use something like this. You know, you might want to uh, define the type to be just stat function, stat function int of int, and you're good to go. It's going to compile and it's going to run. You are capturing the variable. You can convert a lambda or uh, you can actually not really convert. You can uh, initialize a stat function from a lambda. It's going to work. No problems whatsoever, but std function really, uh, when we have lambdas, why would you do it, right? Uh, this is uh, not the right solution. You are also not killing a fly with a hammer. Are there any other solutions? Of course there are, of course there are. And the first one is just to add another level of indirection. You know, this is the most common solution to every kind of a programming problem, add another level of indirection and uh, most likely it's going to work. So now our sum is still a lambda that takes a parameter, but internally this lambda, this sum lambda, will define another lambda, a nested lambda, and call it. So you can see here, uh, it's calling this lambda, which is not yet defined. It's going to be defined within the body. Uh, it will be called sum implementation. And notice that the first argument you pass to it is also the sum implementation. So this way you solve this recursive problem. Uh, you pass the, the reference to, to, to itself uh, as the first argument. Uh, the sum implementation is not so complex. It's just a very similar lambda to the previous lambdas, so to the previous recursive lambdas, with the only difference that the first argument that you take is this uh, reference to self. And later on, you will pass the sum implementation as self. And of course, uh, you also call this self later on in the recursive step. Uh, is it a good solution? Well, it is, it works. On the other hand, it's totally bad. I find nested lambdas particularly unreadable. And especially if the level of, uh, uh, of, of the nesting approaches three or four, they totally stop to be readable. Uh, it's, it's a block of code, it's a wall of code. Secondly, it's uh, not really a solution which is portable. Basically, you, every time you run, write a recursive lambda, you need to, again, write two different lambdas, right? So this is not something you would like to have. You would like to actually have something like this, that you write first your sum implementation uh, that still takes the reference to itself as the first argument, so it can call it recursively later on. And later on, you apply some magic source onto it, some magic something, and uh, it makes the recursion possible, right? And actually something like this exists. So, and it's been known in the functional programming world uh, for decades, and this is the so-called Y Combinator. So Y Combinator, solves our problem. Y combinator is a higher order function. And in this case, it's a higher order structure even. Let's call this structure recurse because that's what it's going to do. It's going to recurse, right? Nothing else. Uh, the first thing that you put in this Y combinator is of course the function that the sum function uh, that you want to use later on when you call it. And the sum function is again defined here, so you can use the sum function. Nothing has changed here. It's still we are grabbing the reference to ourselves of the first argument and the n, and we do the recursive call. And we want to grab it. Now, this grabbing of the function uh, is actually very simple. It happens because of the aggregate initialization. So we don't need to write a constructor. Notice it's a structure. All the members are public. And if all the members are public, we can use their aggregate initialization to initialize all the members uh, of our structure. Here it's, here it's just one member function. Uh, so the only thing that we need to do is initialize it by moving our lambda into it. We are done. Now we have to write uh, the operator itself, so something that we are going to call later on. And again, writing is it is quite straightforward. You just take arguments, any number of arguments, so it's a parameter pack that you take, and then you call the lambda function internally. So you call the lambda that you grabbed internally, nothing else. You call it by passing first the reference to this, so you call the lambda, 
and forwarding the arguments to it. And you also return it, you know, because you have to return it as a recursive call. Otherwise, it's not going to work. So inside this function call operator, you call the lambda, and the lambda in reverse calls your function uh, call operator. So it's a mutual recursion, uh, recursion uh, thing when one function calls the other and the other calls the first one. And it's going to work just beautifully. When you write a piece of code like this, you have a Y combinator or one of the possible implementations of it, uh, and it's going to enable your recursion. It's a generic function, so uh, higher order function, and you can use it on anything you want. Now, to make it fully work, you also have to add something that's called uh, a uh, deduction guide for our initialization. Remember that we were initial using aggregate initialization, but the compiler also needs to be able to deduce the type f, and to be able for for the compiler to be able to deduce the type f, you need to add the deduction guide. But it's pretty simple. It just says that when you call, uh, when you use aggregate initialization with some type f, then you are going to instantiate the structure recurs of type f. Nothing else. Now, can you do better than this? Of course we can. Of course we can. Uh, the thing I don't like about this implementation is that we're introducing an unnecessary member variable. We are introducing f uh, func of type of f inside. So we are basically uh, adding something that's totally not needed because why would you need a member variable just to be able to uh, recurse? There is a better way of doing it or a better way, I think the better way. And the better way is using inheritance. So instead of having this one, we can inherit from the lambda. We can inherit from the type actually of the lambda, not from the lambda itself, but from the type of the lambda. Remember that the lambda, and this is, uh, sorry, remember that each lambda gives a rise to a closure type. And now we are inheriting from this closure type, nothing else. So we are basically inheriting also the function call operator of this closure type. And you can use it later on, you know. Now, to make it fully work, we also have to replace this recursive call because now we don't have func anymore as a member variable. We inherit from something, so we have to basically call our base class uh, function call operator. And the official way of doing it is doing it like this, right? It's nothing special. You are just calling a function call operator of the base class. Nothing else changes. The rest stays the same. And this is, in my opinion, the, one of the most beautiful tricks that exists nowadays when you are playing with lambdas on where you are trying to compose a higher level abstraction with lambdas because it enables you things that are much more difficult to do without inheritance. And slowly, we'll go through other possibilities. Uh, now, if you are still wondering why it will work, because we're still kind of using the aggregate, in, aggregate initialization for this one, and it's an important remark, I think, uh, it works because aggregate initialization also work, works for classes that inherit from other classes. And basically, it works like this when you use the aggr aggregate initialization uh, for classes that inherit from something, that each direct public base uh, of your child class is going to be copy initialized from the corresponding item uh, in the list of the aggregate initialization, in this case, from the corresponding lambda. And notice that you can also move the lambda into it, and then your base class is going to be move initialized. Uh, sorry, not move initialized. Uh, yes, sorry, move initialized, uh, which is also a neat trick to do. Now, I already said about initialization, and we had a very beautiful talk about initialization a moment ago uh, from Jonathan. Uh, and I will also call, talk a little about initialization, because when you talk about lambdas and when people ask about what are the applications of lambdas, one of the most common answers is using them for complex initialization. And what is meant by it is that we, when you want to initialize some kind of a variable, uh, be it uh, like a member variable and local variable, or even provide a default um, value to an argument to a function, you can use lambdas uh, 
to do complex calculations. So in this case, for example, I'm having a print number function that takes uh, an argument, a parameter of type integer, and I provide a default value for it, which is the sum of all the integers uh, from 0 to 42. It's a complex initialization, and this is one of the biggest actual use cases of lambdas, complex initialization. Now, what about if you want to do something else? If you basically also uh, stepping a bit uh, on the same ground as Jonathan did, if you want to log when you initialize. So ima imagine a very simple scenario. When you have a variable and you want to initialize it with some value and at the same time log uh, the fact that it was initialized with this value. Well, you can easily come up uh, with a very simple function that does it, right? Like log init is a function that takes a string view and some argument. And what it does is, for example, prints it or logs it in any other way uh, to the stud studsy out and then returns forwarded the argument so it can be used to initialize your X. Now, this is a good approach, but it's also very, a very bad approach. This is a one-shot function. You just write it once and it's used only once for your particular scenario. You cannot easily extend it. You cannot compose it. You cannot do anything with this. And particularly, if you want to change your logging mechanism, you basically have to rewrite your function or add some lines to it and so on and so on. It's not a generic facility. You would like basically to have something like this. You would like to be able to construct a type let it be called log init t type that you can initialize with your logging facilities. So with the ways that you want to log. Like in this case, I want to initialize it with two different log things. The first one being uh, logging to a file. And the second one just logging to the standard output. And I want it to work basically in the same way as previously. Uh, after creating a log init with those two lambdas, uh, I want to just express that some x is equal to log in it and then, you know, pass my logging message together with the variable value. Now, this is a very easy to write when you know the inheritance trick. The only thing you do need to do, to do is inherit from the lambda expression, right? Uh, because again, we have lambda expressions that must facilitate our logging. So you inherit from this lambda expression. And now we have the function call, call operator that takes the string view, so the method that we want to log, log together with the argument. And inside, we call our operator of the lambda, the function call operator of the closure type, and we return the forwarded argument. Uh, nothing can go wrong, right? Now, the only problem with this one is that there is only one lambda there. And on the previous slide, I had two lambdas. And to be able to capture or use more than one log things, so one than, uh, more than one log destinations, you need to actually inherit from multiple lambdas, which is also totally possible. You can inherit from multiple lambdas by introducing a template argument pack with the three dots and inheriting from this uh, template argument pack. Still going to work. Now, the only problem or the only problem that is left after you inherited from multiple lambdas is how you call the multiple lambdas that you inherited from in your function call operator. And this again can be solved using the facilities that we got quite recently in C17 when the fault expressions were introduced. What I am doing there is I am expanding these three dots, which can be multiple types one after another, uh, into separate function calls. Notice that what I'm doing is I'm calling the fs operator, the function call operator, passing the message and argument, then I'm putting a comma and three dot. What the compiler will do when it sees something like this, for example, when it see, when you initialized your log init t with three different lambdas, uh, let it be lambda fs1, fs2, and fs3, it will expand this a fault expression into something like this. It will be basically three different calls of this function call operator on those three different lambdas or three different base classes. And it's going to work. This is the fault expression uh, applied. And it's one of the, I think, best applications of it or one of the most generic applications of it. We are here actually folding over the comma operator. This is a comma operator fault. 
Uh, well, to make it fully work, you of course need to uh, provide a uh, right template, uh, argue, sorry, uh, deduction guide for the uh, compiler to know what you mean uh, when you aggregate, initialize this uh, log init t. Uh, but the only addition that you need to do is add three dots everywhere to f, and it's going to work. Uh, arguably, you can write the same kind of thing using the facilities that Lambda, uh, that C++ twenty provides. So you can write the same log init thingy. Uh, using the new additions to C++20, uh, specifically unique, uh, using the init capture pack expansion and using explicit R template arguments. Uh, so you can also basically get exactly the same functionality without uh, using the inheritance trick or without writing a special structure. Uh, but it's not always true. There are scenarios when this is not enough, when lambdas and C++20 are not enough. And one of them is this situation. Imagine that you want to write a lambda. Uh, this is a very simple logging lambda that uh, just takes a message and sends it to sit out, nothing else. And then you want to use this lambda in this quite weird way. So you basically want to use the stream output operator on this lambda. Well, this is not going to even compile, right? But this can compile. When you wrap this lambda into a specific type that facilitates this kind of operations, it's going to compile. And this is something you cannot achieve just with lambdas and C20 lambdas, because lambdas never exposed a stream output operator. But you can do it manually. And when you do it manually, and when you do it correctly, you can again even put multiple lambdas into your logger. And then when you stream something to your logger type that inherits from multiple lambdas, these messages or these uh, values will be sent to both of the lambdas one after another, and you will get logging, and you will be able to chain also those operations. Now, the way to implement it uh, looks very much like the previous one. So we again have a structure logger that inherits from multiple lambdas. What changes now is the way that we implement the function call operator or the only function actually that our structure has. There, it's not the function call operator anymore, it's the stream output operator. And notice that it returns a reference to itself. So it returns a reference to a logger. And this, of course, enables chaining of this stream output operations, like you can first send Alice and then follow it by something else. This is something you cannot achieve just with lambdas and just with C20. Now, if you look at the previous example, so if you look at this and at all this chaining, and especially the chaining that happens here, you will notice that this looks very much like a very well known object oriented design pattern, the so called chain of responsibility. When you have an argument, when you have some kind of a data, and you send it to different handlers. So you send it to different objects that can either do something with this data or do nothing with this data and you know just forward it further. This is a so-called change of responsibility and we already basically almost implemented it on the previous slide. Uh, to expand a bit and to build a very typical chain of responsibility, let's expand on our logging. So now our logging, instead of just sending a message, uh, has some extra facilities built into it. Uh, specifically, we define an enumeration severity with different levels of logs of actually the you know, occurrence severity, like an info information warning on an error. And the lambdas that we define that will compose later the whole logger now take the severity as the first argument. And depending on this severity, they decide on whether to handle the message and log the message or not. Like, and you know, this is really a typical chain of responsibility, which you can then later on build with this lambdas and use just like this. So you can call it uh, with different severities and different messages. Now, writing this looks very similar to what we had, what we had 
up till now. Again, you inherit from multiple lambdas. Sorry. And inside, we just use a fault expansion, uh, fault expression. So we use a binary fault over the comma operator. Actually, it's a unary. Uh, uh, sorry, it's a unary fault over the comma operator. And each lambda will now receive, or each lambda from which you inherit, uh, or each base class from basically which you inherit, will now receive a message and will decide on whether to log it or not log it, depending on the severity of this message. But this is not the canonical representation. The canonical representation of the responsibility chain calls for something extra. And this something extra is that each handler after handling the piece of data and deciding on whether it handled it or not, or also returns this fact to the caller or basically to the responsibility chain uh, facilitator. If any handler, if a particular handler handled the data, the data is not forwarded anymore or the message is not forwarded anymore to other chains uh, to other links in your chain because it doesn't make any sense it was already handled and you return the call if it wasn't handled then of course it's propagated so our loggers will now look more like this notice that each of those loggers after handling the message returns true and if it didn't handle the message it returns false building of the responsibility chain looks exactly the same and calling it also looks the same uh, the only difference is, of course, in the implementation. We still inherit from multiple lambdas using the uh, argument pack or the template argument pack. This is the only way because we want to use different uh, handlers in our responsibility chain, right? Now, the difference is that instead of using a comma operator as before, uh, in our fault expression, we are using a Boolean OR. And this Boolean OR basically will, or after you expand this fault expression, it will call each base class one after another, its function call operator. So it, call, it will call each Lambda. And if the Lambda returned true, then the execution of the chain will stop because it's a Boolean OR operator. And when one of the elements evaluated to true, then the execution stops. Otherwise, the next element will try to handle the message. Now, when you have something like this, so it's a unary write fault uh, over the Boolean OR operator, uh, you can also actually return the value. Notice that we can easily return the total value of this whole chain. And this value will basically inform us uh, on whether something handled uh, our message or not. The rest doesn't change. Now let's build a bit further on it. Let's imagine that it's even uglier. And instead of returning true or false, we are returning some optional. So when we manage to successfully log a message, we are going to return a standard optional of some log entry. Otherwise, if we didn't successfully um, handled the message, we are going to return a null option now. Uh, we are, you know, uh, modern and we want to use the facilities that we have. Now, it complicates things. It complicates things because you just cannot use directly the uh, default uh, over the Boolean or it's not going to work. What you have to do in such a case is explicitly grab the first lambda you inherit from. You have to grab from it because you have to grab the result. You have to grab this optional. It will return when you call it. So you have to change your inheritance uh, a bit or the, right, the way you write your inheritance. And later on, once you've done it, once you inherit from one lambda and some additional lambdas, the first thing to do is, of course, to grab the result of calling the first lambda. Because if it's OK, if you grabbed it and it evaluates to true, uh, then there is nothing, or actually when the optional contains something, then there is nothing else to be done. Otherwise, you have to call the other lambdas. And now you can use the old good uh, fault over the binary or uh, once you grab this result, using the fact that an optional 
is convertible to a boolean and you know again this will work notice that you are also able to move the results uh, of calling each of those uh, base lambdas or base closure types into your result as you go and use the or operator to stop the execution once the message is handled properly and afterward you of course return the result you know there is nothing else to be done and uh, again this works beautifully now it works so beautifully that you can even write a fizz bus with it uh, it becomes a child's play uh, to write a fizz bus in a very nice you know compact way what if you have a super ugly case? Because we kind of handled a few cases uh, with a varying degree of ugliness. Imagine that you have a super ugly case. You have a so-called global state. So your loggers cannot directly communicate that they handled a message or didn't handle the message. What they do is they manipulate a global state. Uh, let's say it's a you know handled variable. And there are two functions. They cannot even be lambdas, set handled, and get handled uh, that your loggers call uh, specific, specifically they call the set handled if they handled uh, some particular piece of data which also means that your chain of responsibility needs to use is handled after each logger has done its work to check whether it has done its work right so its side effects its global state it's getting ugly uh, the first thing to notice is that when you call your chain of responsibility, you need to pass the is handled to it because it will use it after each call to the base class function call operator to check whether it handled uh, doing something with your message. And you can see it here. I mean, uh, I just grabbed the is handled as SF. I'm calling the first base class function call operator and I'm checking whether my message was properly handled by my first chain in the link. Well, if it wasn't, I have to call the other functions. So I have to call the other base classes function call operators. Uh, but this is not that easy. This is not that easy if you write your code like this. Uh, and writing actually a fault expression for it becomes quite uh, involved. There is an easier way. And the easier way of doing it calls of inheriting from the responsibility chain uh, templated on the rest of the lambdas that you constructed your respons responsibility chain from. When you do something like this, when you inherit from responsibility chain of FS, notice it's only from the remaining lambdas, what you can do is a recursive call that looks like this. So you can call your parent class function call operator, passing both the SF and the arguments to it, and you are going to get a recursive call, no problems whatsoever, it's going to be handled uh, with the rest of the of those lambdas well because it's a recursion you also need to do the end uh, you you have to stop the recursion at some point in this case you have to specialize the responsibility ch chain for the situation when there is only one function uh, but this is actually quite easy it's re basically copy pasting the code that you already had uh, specializing one for one function and calling just just one base class function call operator and nothing else uh, the rest works exactly the same so we covered quite a lot we covered basically the inheritance trick and we talked about a few different ways of inheriting from lambda for different scenarios like a simple case when you inherit from f1 lambda when you want to inherit from multiple lambdas and then you can use pike expansion and fold expressions uh, about inheriting from multiple lambdas when you want to pick the result of the first lambdas for some specific purpose and for handling very tough scenarios with recursive calls and inheriting uh, actually recursive inheritance uh, but there is more there is much more and i'm just going to show one of them now uh, because my time is running up and the 
there is more is programming with types. Remember or notice actually that when we were constructing our chain of responsibilities, we were actually constructing uh, specific types because there were very strong types. It was responsibility chains templated on some Lambda types. There were strong types and the compiler was able actually to do a lot of work for us when it comes to type checking. Now, some of you don't like it. Some of you don't like it because you say that, okay, it's not flexible. For example, when I program with types, uh, I cannot add another logger once I constructed uh, my chain or whatever facility you are, you are constructing. So I cannot append another Lambda to what I already have. And this is not true. You absolutely can do it. You can add new handlers or remove handlers from an already existing chain, no problems whatsoever. Well, the way to do it, so imagine that you have a scenario like this, when you constructed your responsibility chain with just info logger and a warning logger, and now you also want to handle the error somehow. And the way to do it is simply, you know, the same way as you would do it with other things. So you construct your error, log error logger, so a specific logger that can handle uh, logs that are of error severity, and you just append it to your existing chain of responsibility by calling a specific function, like set next, for example. Now, there is one thing to notice here. And the one thing to notice here is that I'm grabbing the result of calling this function. I'm grabbing this result and assigning a new variable name to it, like rc with error. And the reason for it will become obvious in a moment. The way to implement such a function or the set net function looks like this. We are still in the realm of our responsibility chain, which inherits from multiple lambdas, which has also the function call operator. And now we add another function to it, the set next function, which of course grabs another lambda. So it's a template, it's a function template because it's you don't know what you're going to grab, but you need to deduce its type. So it's a template, uh, uh, sorry, it's a function template templated on G called set next. Now you grab a function and the next thing to notice is that you are not modifying your existing responsibility chain. What you are doing is you are returning a new, totally new type, new instance of a new type, which next to the functions that you handled before, now also handles the extra or actually contains the extra lambda that you just appended to it. So the new responsibility chain is templated both on F, FS, and G. Of course, you have to initialize it properly. Uh, so you can copy initialize it from your base class if you don't intend to use your previous responsibility chain, like I do it here. I copy initialize both F uh, and FS pack. You can see that it's a pack because again, I'm using the ellipsis here. And last but not least, least, I also have to initialize my last base class, the G class. And another thing to notice is that when you write code like this, you also have to remove any references uh, that might have been deduced for G. I mean, G, when you pass an L value to it, uh, to the set next function will be deduced as an L value reference to G and you cannot inherit from an L value reference from, uh, from a G reference type. It's not a type, so you cannot inherit from this. That's why you have to remove uh, any references uh, uh, which are deduced for it, let's say. And you know, this work, you're re returning a new type, which you can use. You're even better. You are totally not modifying your previous type. It's still there. You can still use if you haven't moved your previous state, your previous responsibility chain, because you use copy initialization, it will work. Of course, if you want, if you don't want to use the previous responsibility chain, you don't need to do it. Uh, you can totally, uh, you can just move uh, this and move this pack expansion into the uh, aggregate initializer, and your new responsibility chain will be move initialized. Uh, you know, this is basically the end of this uh, because the time is running up. I still have a few slides which I'm going to skip. Uh, so there is the uh, 
time for answers now, uh, answers now because we have five minutes left. Uh, what I want to say at the end of this talk is that lambdas are much more much powerful uh, that you can imagine. You don't have to only use them to perform some stupid computation. You can compose with lambdas and you can write great composable facilities using lambdas and inheriting from lambdas. Uh, what's even better, uh, if you master this technique properly, you're going to be super safe because you're going to be programming with types, uh, with very strong types. Uh, you will never modify your types whenever you add something to uh, to your structures by uh, extending the inheritance or even removing something. You are always getting a new type, so you are safe in this way. The compiler will help you checking. There is no dynamic polymorphism there. So for example, if you have a couple of lambdas stored uh, or you are inheriting from, the compiler will check whether you can use the structure that inherits from these lambdas uh, in a specific scenario when you try to call it with some arguments. And if not, you will just fail and you will get a compilation error, which is much better than dynamic polymorphism in this case. Uh, I must say that we didn't even start talking about it. There is so much more to it uh, that I could be talking another one hour about it. Uh, but for now, thank you very much for listening to me. And this will be the end of the talk now. Uh, and yeah, I will now answer the questions. So I'll put my headphones on. Uh, because I noticed there are some questions, five questions accumulated. Uh, I'm going to start with the simplest one. Uh, so with the last one uh, from Jakob. Uh, slide 43, let's switch to slide 43. I hope I can answer all the questions. Here it is. And it says, how does the chaining produce an optional log entry? I guess it's a previous slide. Uh, it's this one. Uh, well, uh, it's, a, it's a very good question. This is actually the only reason why I had to use uh, what I had to actually inherit first from F and then from FS. It's one of the ways actually to do it. I could also uh, just use, uh, I mean, I could deduce uh, the type that the F will return when called with these arguments. Uh, but this way I'm protecting myself against not being to uh, default initialize the result of calling the first lambda. So notice that what I'm doing first is calling my first uh, la base lambda, which will return an optional, right? So I'm grabbing the optional and res is now an optional. And then I am using a fold expression. So I am folding fs over the binary uh, Boolean operator, but this res is still an optional. It's just that I'm using it in a Boolean context. Uh, so when there is a Boolean or operator, it will automatically or implicitly will be converted to Boolean. And when it contains something, it will evaluate to true. And if it doesn't contain anything, it will evaluate to false. But it's still my good old optional. And this chain will stop evaluating when one of the optionals uh, will convert to true. So basically, when it contains something, uh, whenever it is, so in, in whichever instance it happens of the unfolding. And once I've done it, uh, I can return it. Uh, this is the only reason why I had to split it, uh, because it's just impossible to write it in one line anymore. And I hope it answers your question. Uh, slide 24, let's go to slide 24. Um, Isn't it a good example for what writing the lambda is much more complex and less efficient when writing the closure itself, even if it means that operator is heavily templated? Uh, yes, in a way it is. I, 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 I fully agree with you. Uh, it's just that people are very um, 
excited when they see recursion and they always want to go uh, recurse with lambdas and uh, some of us get even more excited when they hear like things like y combinator but i fully agree um, you normally it's much it's much easier to write uh, in this case specific case when you talk about recursion i mean why would you use uh, uh, a lambda for it uh, uh, it's not really the best example of using a lambda however if you want to you are able to do it and uh, the code is still super efficient uh, everything is cons expert here uh, i mean i didn't put it there because there it's uh, the slide didn't fit it but normally the operator the function call operator here will be const expert the lambda it, itself is const expert or its function call operator and actually in many cases it will be just calculated uh, during the compile time uh, otherwise, believe me, the compiler is easily uh, able to uh, rec or not easily, but it is, as far as I uh, remember, rec able to recognize mutual recursion uh, and optimize it uh, quite correctly here. So it's not really more efficient. Maybe it's more readable when you write it yourself. Uh, Benjamin, what does the folding over the comma operator mean? Why are the args returned? Let's go to the slide number 30. Uh, folding is a complex matter, I must say. Uh, the first time I've seen folds, uh, my head boiled. Uh, here the fold is over this uh, argument pack. So notice that we are passing a couple of functions, possibly. Uh, it's going to be visible in a moment. So we are passing a few lambdas to the function make lock in it. Uh, so we are taking a parameter pack. We are also later on forwarding those, those lambdas. Uh, so this uh, lambdas uh, into the lambda that is being constructed in this uh, function by uh, capturing them and uh, in the initializer of the lambda. So in the capture list, so we capture them and forward them. And now we have a couple of lambdas, possibly a couple of lambdas. And that's what this expansion means here. Uh, we are folding basically over the comma. And what we are folding is those functions. So uh, one after another lambda will be called here, uh, which looks uh, like a bit of magic, I must say. Uh, and if you're not really used to it, uh, yeah, that's... Uh, that's not really cool. Uh, slide 24, why can we use, uh, I'm going to slide 24. Um, and the question is, why can we use the base class function call operator here? Uh, in the Lambda itself, we couldn't. Uh, well, at this moment, the lambda is first of all it's fully defined, and uh, because I mean it is fully defined, the closure is fully defined uh, because you inherited from it, and uh, it's a totally different uh, scenario. You are just inheriting from this lambda now. You are inheriting actually from the closure type, which has a fully defined function call operator, so you can easily call it. There is nothing that blocks you now uh, from doing it. Uh, and that's that's basically the answer to your question. Uh, before you couldn't do it uh, because the closure of the function core operator isn't defined within the lambda. So it's not defined when you write the lambda. It's only defined once you fully write the lambda and create an object of this type, basically. So when you instantiate a closure type, uh, closure type. Oh, uh, but I guess, okay. Uh, the first question, the most upvoted question is, what's the use case for recursive lambda over a recursive ordinary function? What makes it worse the complexity? Nothing. Uh, nowadays, nothing. Uh, uh, there is a very fine proposal now uh, that deducing this, uh, which will solve the problem of recursive lambdas and remove all the complexity from the recursive lambdas. So you will be able to write recursive lambdas uh, very easily without investing in all this complexity. And, you know, 
recursive lambdas, I introduced, introduced the recursive lambdas as a vehicle uh, to introduce inheriting from lambdas because recursion is something that almost everybody understands or we generally understand it as computer programmers, as software developers. And it's a good vehicle to introduce how you can inherit from a lambda. Otherwise, uh, unless you are writing functional code and you really, you know, you understand what you're doing, uh, uh, there is no good use case for it. And the last, uh, the last one is not really a question, it's that Jonathan Smiller uh, blog has a recent article on tricks with forward expressions, uh, which I also uh, cordially invite you to uh, read. I can imagine that it's, um, uh, uh, I haven't read it, but I'm knowing uh, Jonathan, I think it's a pretty nice article. Uh, Otherwise, uh, thank you for listening to my talk and thank you for uh, asking the questions. Uh, I hope you enjoyed it. And uh, yeah, have a good rest of the conference. Thank you.